on this episode of Indiana Education Insight. Where do you see education heading in the 21st century? I think you're right, uh, Dr. Koopman. Uh, marketing and public relations is going to be everything for school districts. If you're not a fan of your educational system, no one else is going to be. Every week, the Indiana Association of Public School Superintendents is taking you inside today's Indiana education collaboration and tomorrow's education trends. We're staying on the pulse of public school innovators throughout Indiana and beyond. Join our conversation and contribute to our upcoming topics at iapssin.org slash podcast. Here's your host, Dr. J.T. Koopman. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Indiana Education Insight. I'm Dr. J.T. Koopman, and this podcast is being delivered by our IPSS team and produced by Edge Media Studios. As the executive director of IPSS, I'm excited to bring you a weekly show where we feature Indiana education innovators from all over our great state, from students to superintendents. We'll also be talking to higher education leaders and educators at the state level as we work together as proactive public education advocates. That's why IPSS is here and why we're doing this show. Now, just a little bit of background on me. As a lifelong Indiana resident with my entire educational career in public education as a teacher, assistant principal, principal, and assistant superintendent as well as a superintendent, I'm very passionate about serving the needs of children attending Indiana public schools. I'm also the past president of IPSS and so proud to be bringing you this show today. Every week, we're going to be talking about trending topics in public education while bringing in Indiana education innovators to hear their perspective. As with any organization, it takes great leadership to be successful, and that's one of the reasons why IPSS is developing great school district leaders today. We are pleased to have two relatively young and bright Indiana school superintendents discussing the changing role of the superintendency in the 21st century. It is always great to have experienced and passionate educators joining the show. So let's get started with today's conversation. Topics and trends in Indiana education. Today's guests are Dr. Jeff Butts, Superintendent, MSD Wayne Township, and Dr. Sean Smith, Superintendent, MSD Lawrence Township. Both of the districts are in Indianapolis, Indiana, and these young superintendents are in growing urban districts with over 16,000 students, 1,500 staff members, and multi-million dollar budgets under their direction. Let's find out how they are viewing the changing role of today's superintendents. Welcome, Dr. Butts and Dr. Smith, and thank you for joining our show today. Uh, we're very proud to have you, and uh, we're going to ask you a few questions and uh, entertain our audience today. Thank you, Dr. Koopman, for having us. So to get started with today's show, let's start out, uh, Dr. Smith and uh, Dr. Butts, and if you could just give us a little background on uh, how you got involved with education and how you became uh, superintendents of uh, large urban districts. You know, I grew up in... in uh a family of educators, and, and my uncle was a superintendent uh, for 19 years in, in Illinois. And so I, I decided that I wanted to become not just a teacher when I was in high school, but uh, that I wanted to become a superintendent. And through my pathway, I've had the opportunity to work in rural school districts, in suburban school districts, and in urban school districts. And what I would tell anyone who is pursuing the superintendency and pursuing a leadership role is you have to find that place that is a good fit for you. And I think in different parts of my career, uh, I've found that different locations and different types of districts were good fits. Um, and as I had the opportunity to join the MSD of Wayne Township in 2006, uh, I found a home where uh, I knew that uh, my skill set was, was uh, well suited for the types of students and the community that uh, we were working with. And uh, it's just been a great opportunity for me to continue to flourish and to work with uh, with an outstanding opportunity in the MSD of Wayne Township. Well, thank you, Dr. Butts. Dr. Smith, how about thank you? Thank you, Dr. Koopman. And I, I want to thank you for telling me that I'm young. I really appreciate that. I had a magical <laughs> year this year. I turned 50. So I really appreciate that. And I, I do feel young today. But uh, I, I'm, first of all, I'm a native Hoosier, born and raised in the state of Indiana and from the city of Indianapolis. And I have had the privilege of serving my entire career here in the city of Indianapolis. I've served in every 
leadership position from a classroom teacher, coach, assistant principal, principal of both high school and middle school, a director and as well as assistant superintendent in large school corporations uh, here in the Indianapolis area uh, from the Indianapolis Public Schools to Washington Township, Pike Township, and now Lawrence. I've just had the privilege of serving uh, with some great leaders who tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, Sean, you need to become a school administrator. Uh, I'm a product of the 1980s, and I was on my way to having a career in business and then realized that my passion was teaching and learning, and I decided to become a classroom teacher. It's probably the best decision I ever made, and I haven't regretted for almost 30 years. And so working uh, in a career in a situation with great leaders, uh, I worked under Dr. Eugene White. Uh, I worked under Dr. Rudy Wilson, and of course, I spent 15 consecutive years working under uh, Mr. Nate Jones, who was my direct supervisor from a principal, all the way being an assistant superintendent. And I, I had some rich experiences with those gentlemen that encouraged me to think about leadership. And when opportunities open up, I continue to move on and, and, and move to that next level. I totally agree with Dr. Butts. It's about the right fit, the right situation as far as leadership. And uh, those school corporations certainly prepared me for that, but it was the right fit for Lawrence Township in the right time to be superintendent in that district. Well, with the richness of both of your um, backgrounds and the experiences that mm -hmm. you have had, uh, how is the superintendency different today and why is it important for today's school superintendents to understand those changes? Sean, how about you? I, I think, first of all, I think the, you know, I've been around long enough when I can remember we did not have the accountability that we have today and of course that impacts the community and impacts the school board and when they're looking for a superintendent they're looking for someone who can um, work within that framework of creating an environment that will be successful academically at the same time meeting those academic uh, those accountability laws that we have in front of us i think they're looking for someone who's an instructional leader uh, and that's difficult to find one may be very good in management but can't be a leader of teachers uh, I think uh, competition has really changed the, the framework of what we're doing today for superintendents. We, we're no longer the only game in town, and we're forced into becoming more focused on business and competition. Uh, for Jeff and I, we run big businesses. We just have to be honest. I think often we get into the school frame of mind, and I remind people that I'm over 21 different sites, and they're some of the largest institutions in the state of Indiana, and we oversee a huge budget. I have 2,500 people that I oversee, and uh, which creates, uh, it, it's huge. It, it's not a, a small job, but it's really big business. And, and quite frankly, it doesn't really even matter what size, but to that community, whatever dollar amount spent on education is important to that community. So uh, those are some of the things that, that I believe that are, are, that are important for today's superintendents. Okay. How about you, Jeff? Yeah, I would totally agree with Dr. Smith. And, and I think one of the things that um, it's ironic, I, I had an opportunity to have lunch just the other day with retired superintendent from Tippecanoe School Corporation, Dr. Richard Wood, who was one of my mentors and, and uh, really helped to guide my pathway into the superintendency. But, you know, we talked about some of the changes from uh, his time as a superintendent. And, and of course, I've spoken with others who have retired. And um, they're continues to be a growing opportunity for superintendents to engage in their community, to engage with their business leaders, as Dr. Smith mentioned. And, uh, and also then I think it's critical to also be engaged with our politicians, uh, those who are in the General Assembly at uh, our local level, uh, and then those at the federal level in, in uh, uh, the Senate and in Congress uh, as, we work with our, uh, as we work with our elected officials to help to guide the policies that do uh, drive our accountability and, and drive our our funding and, all, and those types of things. But uh, as Dr. Smith mentioned, we are one of the largest employers in our community, and that's true across the state of Indiana. It's true across many communities, even outside of Indiana. Uh, but we are a major economic driver. And so the success of our schools is, is largely dependent upon the success of our community and vice versa. Our communities cannot survive and cannot thrive and continue to grow if our schools are not successful. And so uh, in the last... 15 to 20 years, we've seen a much greater uh, influence from the school superintendent and the school board as it relates to economic development in our in our local uh, communities. And so, uh, for me personally, I'm a board member on our on our chamber of commerce on the west side, in Indy Gateway, which is an economic and community development corporation. Uh, of course, uh, am working very closely uh, with our city county councilors and and. Uh, 
uh, because we're in Indianapolis, we have a great relationship with our mayor, uh, who also is instrumental with, with 11 different school districts in Marion County. It's critical that we all have a relationship with our mayor and can work with him, uh, as well as our other school districts, to uh, continue to not only drive our individual townships and communities uh, and help them to improve, but also the, the city of Indianapolis. So we're, we're kind of in a unique situation uh, here in Marion County. And, uh, of course, with Dr. Smith being on the east side, Lawrence Township, and me being on the far west side with Wayne Township, uh, we have some similar uh, struggles and some similar challenges, but we also uh, have some, some great differences just because of uh, the communities that we serve. Well, with, with all of those things being mentioned, and, and both of you um, are cognizant of those changes, especially working with politicians and business leaders, but we're also seeing significant changes with school funding. Uh, Sean, you mentioned the accountability standards, how we evaluate teachers and principals. Uh, there are just so many factors that have been introduced, uh, primarily through legislative initiatives. And part of our uh, job as an association is to make sure that we are keying in on those elements to help all of our members understand and to be better able to achieve uh, great success as school leaders. So what are some of the key components that you can kind of point to that as an association that we should be focused on in, in training today's school leaders? Well, I think um, there are a number of things that the association can do, and, and one of the challenges I know that uh, any association has, especially one as large as the Indiana Association of Public School Superintendents, are the members that are represented. Uh, and so uh, of, of approximately 300 school districts across the state of Indiana, you have districts that are going to benefit by certain legislation that deals with funding and those that are going to be negatively impacted and, and receive fewer dollars to put into the classroom and, and to educate our children. Uh, and so there is that fine line, that balance that has to occur with an association um, in, in working with our legislators and, and uh, other decision makers. In, in the role of preparing for our upcoming leaders and future superintendents, I think uh, IAPSS has done a phenomenal job with the onboarding process for uh, new superintendents coming into the role, for our aspiring superintendents and helping them to gain a better understanding of some of the um, things they need to prepare for, the challenges that may be uh, in front of them when they, when they are able to, to attain that first superintendency, but also with partnerships uh, like uh, have recently been developed with Butler University and the EPIC program in which um, taking leaders that are, are within their first five years or so and helping them to, uh, to tie in that business piece. That's not something that as superintendents, many of us have the opportunity to go through in our preparation, but we know it's a critical piece as we are working more with our business community and in large corporations like Lawrence Township and Wayne Township, where a significant portion of our day is spent on the business side of managing and, and operating uh, our large organizations. And, and when that falls apart, that piece falls apart, everything else falls apart. And so uh, I know Dr. Smith has some great people that work for him in Lawrence Township, and I can say the same, that their main mission is to focus on what happens inside of our classroom, to, to focus on preparation of our teachers, um, which allows us to have more opportunity to work with our folks in our community and, and focus on that, that business side as well. Right. I, certainly uh, the organization, we have a body of knowledge um, as professional superintendents, and I think the organization can be the conduit for helping people grow. Um, we have rich experiences from top to bottom. And, and I always want to emphasize this. I get into conversations with some of our superintendents about size of the district. It doesn't matter what the size is. It's the experiences that one has in those, those corporations that will enrich their, their abilities. And that should be shared with others. And so what I would encourage the organization to do is be that conduit for uh, uh, conversation, professional development, networking that will allow young superintendents to be successful at what they do because a lot of what we do, uh, there's already people out there that's already experienced those things. And so the more that we can interact with one another, the better. I think this whole concept of finding the, the right fit, we need to, the organization needs to make that happen because not all school districts are the perfect fit in terms of your leadership style. So if the organization can be there to help people find who they are in terms of their leadership style and the right fit to serve a school corporation or board uh, would be great. Uh, those, those are great comments. And, and Sean, you mentioned something that I think is, is certainly a, a key element for our association. 
And we've all had great mentors, and we've all had those people kind of tap us on the shoulder and make those comments about uh, seducing us into a leadership mm-hmm. role, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But we also, um, I believe in the concept of networking. And mm-hmm. if you could just kind of touch on that as, as a component of leadership that, that you feel like is important. Well, I think it's critical. Um, I, I talked about some of the individuals I've been able to meet, and I have colleagues. I mean, I was in a doctorate cohort with Paul Kaiser, who's with us every month. We meet every month in Marion County, and I cherish the the time, and and my time is precious. I mean, I can't make it to every meeting, but the time that I get to interact with my superintendent colleagues is invaluable. Uh, We talk about things from A to Z. We network, and we talk about how things could be better for us. Something that Jeff has may work very well in my corporation, or it may not, but we at least talk about it and learn from one another. And again, I want to emphasize it doesn't matter what size the corporation Uh, I've met uh, individuals from smaller school corporations that could work in our district. I mean, they've got great ideals, great insight, and it's just a matter of how much goes on in in our districts. I mean, Jeff and I work in corporations where something's going to happen every day just from sheer size. Um, You know, I was talking to one of my board members and about a bus on the side of the road. I said, well, that, that occurs every day. Broke down buses. We have 225 school buses. So that's normal for us. Okay. Uh, but, but those opportunities we can get together and share are invaluable. And the principal, the principal association has that format, which I experienced in the state of Indiana. And I noticed that the superintendents have the same thing, networking that can take place with their members. I completely agree. And I, I, and we do have the opportunity in our uh, Marion County group to, to have that collegiality and, and to be able to, to really bounce ideas off of each other. Uh, I would also say that as an association, IEPSS does such a great job with providing opportunities through conferences, um, through committee work, through other, uh, other venues, our district meetings, um, to get together. And, you know, those district meetings, uh, I get to see superintendents that I don't often see from other parts of our district even here. Um, and then, of course, at our conferences, get to see superintendents from across the state. Uh, and just this morning, uh, because of, of the opportunities that I've had uh, to get involved with IAPSS, um, I had the, the opportunity to speak to a small town superintendent uh, with, with less than a, or with fewer than a thousand students and also large school superintendents. And um, to, to Sean's point, I would tell you that um, I think sometimes our smaller school superintendents have a harder job than the larger school superintendents because they don't have the support staff. They, no. they have to be um, really a master of many trades yes. uh, and, uh, and, and don't have, in my case this morning, I met with seven other of, of my superintendent's cabinet members, assistant superintendents, CFOs, CTOs, uh, and, and that group helps to also su- support um, the work that I'm doing and, and to bounce ideas off of. You know, some of our superintendents don't have that opportunity. They don't have that network right inside or that support group right inside of their own district to be able to bounce ideas off of mm-hmm. and get support and uh, and have somebody every now and then to tell you that you're wrong. Because <laughs> as superintendents, we need that you know those critical friends to sometimes tell us that we may not be going down the right pathway. Absolutely, that's a great uh, great segue here to this this next comment. Both of you have been involved in uh, education, either as teachers or educational leaders for a couple of decades now, and you've seen lots of things evolve and change. What are some of the trends that you have seen uh, in the last, uh, let's say, five to ten years? You know, I think we can go back even to the the early 80s when A Nation at Risk first came out. I think that was the beginning of really what we've been experiencing in the last five to ten years, and uh, and that's this really critical eye that our communities, that our uh, really that our nation has on what's happening inside of our schoolhouses, and we've seen a great shift and the opportunities that are provided to our children. We know that in Indiana, uh, we've seen a significant growth in charter schools, in, uh, in private schools, vouchers uh, for, for children to have choice. Uh, and, and I often say, and I share this with our staff, we believe in choice. This morning, 16,300 children chose to attend the schools in the MSD of Wayne Township, and 800 of those are driving from some other community to be sitting in our classroom. So we're not opposed to choice. Um, But I think we've seen an evolution with the change of assessments, with the change of how we grade and and report the grading uh, of our schools with accountability. Um, And we've really had to do a great job as superintendents and our staff with helping our public to understand and helping our public to become more in tune with their local school. And 
through that work, and, and the Gallup poll shows this each and every year, people love their local schools. They think the education system in general is broken, but they love their local schools. And our job, and, and, and we're being very successful at this, as is Lawrence Township, um, is we're helping our public to understand that great things are happening each and every day inside of our classrooms. And uh, that's a significant shift for us because there was a period of time where I wasn't so sure that our communities um, believed in, in our teachers as much as, as they do today because of all of the, the negativity that was coming out in our media and the, the negativity that was being communicated. And that's a hard machine to, um, to break. And that's a hard machine to outdo. And uh, we've just kept plugging away, uh, kept sharing our success stories and, and uh, have our teachers and our buildings really developing that close relationship with our community. And uh, we're seeing that uh, our public is shifting back, as are our legislators. I've seen that here in the last, especially this session and the last couple sessions, that we're starting to see more uh, collaboration, uh, more cooperation, reaching out, um, less finger pointing, and really trying to come to some solutions uh, and some consensus on, on what we need to be doing to help our young children to be successful. Thank you, Jeff. John? Jeff, thanks. Thanks so much. And, and Jeff is right on point. Um, I, I look at it through the eyes. I'm a teacher. I was a teacher by trait and was inspired by another teacher to become a classroom teacher. And as I look today, we have, we always had accountability in education. I don't know any teacher that doesn't hold their kids accountable. It's amazing. Uh, teachers are a different breed. They know their kids. They want them to be successful. But somewhere down the line, we thought if we put the assessment in, that it's going to make the profession better. We're going to get better results. And so we really need to recalibrate that conversation about accountability because the assessment itself, it's not the piece that makes kids successful. It's supposed to be there for the educators. And that's the piece today that, that I'm really troubled by. And as we look back, there were things that we did in the past that worked very well. And I'm not sure that's the thing that has really helped us. Also, the question, or who are the educational experts? Are we talking to classroom teachers, educators? Really, are we even talking to parents? So many people are experts today. When I walk in a school, my experts are the teachers. They know their subject matter. They know their content. They know their methodology. But we have so many people coming at us telling us, what is good for children and what we should be doing. So we have to be careful with that. Also, what is success in education? How do we determine whether kids are successful in schools today is the big change that we have. Uh, it's through standardized testing. Well, our whole accountability system in Indiana is based on how they perform on one test. It doesn't take into account all the other things that children do. And, uh, and then the question comes to us, are we better today because of all the accountability that we put in place? and at what cost. And, and those are the things that I believe that have really trended us in a different direction. We have so many more people today that are in education. Look at the number of state laws that we have, legislation that we have in education. We have so many people driving home agendas for what children, and I want us to think about this, children uh, from elementary age, preschool age, all the way up to 18 year olds, driving the agenda from the outside. And that, that concerns me because we have great educators today. Those who have stayed with us and are committed, the warriors as I call them, they are very good at what they do and they have been and are gonna to continue to get results, so. Well, you know, Jeff, um, you, you mentioned charter schools and vouchers. Sean, you've mentioned things about accountability and testing. We also have a change in school funding uh, with circuit breakers that have made it very difficult for school districts, especially growing school districts to have the funding necessary to do the business that they need to do. We've seen how we have changed enrollment boundaries to open boundaries, mm -hmm. and that's put you in the marketing business, so to speak. So just a few items there have really changed what school leaders are expected to know and, and what they're expected to do. If you could kind of take a look into your crystal ball, where do you see education heading in the 21st century? Well, I, I think you're right, uh, Dr. Koopman. Uh, marketing and public relations is going to be everything for school districts. If you're not a fan of your educational system, no one else is going to be in this current market in the state of Indiana. We embrace competition. We don't have a problem. Uh, what it has done is has woke up a sleeping giant. And, and Lawrence, and I know in Wayne, 
Uh, we take great pride in marketing uh, and branding what we do as a school corporation. I have something for everyone, and I have to make that known to everyone in the city of Indianapolis and beyond. I think as I look into a crystal ball uh, in the 21st century in the state of Indiana, we have to get ready for uh, tremendous diversity. And I'm not just talking racially, but socioeconomically. I think we also have to start paying close attention to, to what makes teaching work well. Teaching is a noble profession. In order for us to be great in education, we have to have great teacher leaders. And so we have to find a way to change it. And I think that that movement is taking place. I cannot bash teachers and expect to have a great profession. Uh, otherwise, people are not going to come in. Uh, we certainly have to make sure we have more focus on professional development for teachers. And I'm not just talking about a one-day workshop. Teachers need ongoing support and professional development so that they can better work with the children. Um, uh, and, and then, as that we mentioned earlier, choice will be the focus uh, within our state. But something to think about as we begin to have all this choice, are we segregating our communities in such a way where we won't have a more inclusive environment? And I'm not just talking about race, but I'm talking about on socioeconomic lines. Uh, as schools become more choice oriented, will we exclude certain kids because they can't get into those special schools? In our community, Jeff, and I certainly know in Wayne, you guys have a lot of pride in your community as well as we do. And the people who live within our community want to have great public schools. And I hope that's the thrust as I look into the crystal ball for all communities. I don't think we need to have winners and losers and schools closing up because of whatever. Uh, those schools mean a lot to their communities, and we need to make sure that they're all strong. Couldn't agree more. We had, uh, ironically, our Alumni Wall of Fame just this last Saturday and had graduates from 1953 all the way through 2006, eight of which were inducted into the uh, Wall of Fame. And uh, to see the pride that not only those that graduated in the mid-50s have, uh, even though the community has changed a great deal, the school district has changed a great deal, um, there's still that ongoing pride, and, and that is, is definitely seen. I want to take one piece and kind of expand upon it that Dr. Smith mentioned, and I think um, that is uh, what we're doing to prepare our children and the opportunities that we're preparing them for. We're preparing our children today for jobs that don't exist. Um, and in order to do so, we need to get away from um, the, the rote memorization that we have been uh, forced into or pigeonholed into with the type of testing that we've uh, been giving our children so that, and, and developing good test takers um, and get back to this idea of critical thinking and processing and, and, and able to, to be, have self-motivation and what we call the Wayne Habits of Success so that our students can be successful when they walk ac across that stage and leave us uh, in whatever they choose to pursue. Uh, and that's a, a significant change for us. It's a, it's a significant shift for us and with us, not knowing necessarily what jobs are going to be available, which ones are going to go away. You know, Wayne Township, Carrier Corporation, and Rex Nord both are, are leaving this year, taking a significant number of jobs. Those, those, those have been staples in our community forever. Um, the GM stamping plant leaving and, and all the different changes that we've had and the automation that's occurring. We, we met with a group of industry professionals just last week to talk about STEM and, and Project Lead the Way opportunities for our students. And that was one of the conversations is we need to prepare our children for continued automation and, and whatever technology is going to bring. Uh, and that's a much different shift in our focus uh, of, of how, how we're preparing our children. Uh, and I think that's, you know, to look in that crystal ball, that's what we're, that's what we're looking towards. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I, I appreciate those, those comments from both of you. Um, we're seeing um, an influx of population from the rural areas of Indiana and into the more metro, uh, metropolitan districts that, that your districts include, which is going to bring you another diverse set of students yes, and, and uh, additional needs that those students and families are desiring. We're also seeing a change in, in how our public views every child needs to go to college. And so now we have a, a, a trend toward vocational and technical education. And speaking to some of the things that you mentioned, Jeff, is what's that job that hasn't even been created going to look like? And how, as school districts, are we going to prepare those students? So additional challenges for school leaders to be able to have that ability to be uh, agile enough to, to make the changes on, on the run, so to speak. Uh, but we also have the political pressures that say we need to do this or we need to do that, mm -hmm. and we have to react to those things too. So your jobs certainly are 
uh, difficult and different uh, than they were just a few years ago. So I appreciate your, your comments on those things. Um, so talking about that, uh, are, are there special things that you're doing within your district? And I know, Jeff, you mentioned some of those things. And Sean, I'd like to have your comments about mm -hmm. how you're being agile enough to meet those new needs for your students that are coming in today. Yeah, I just to expand upon uh, my earlier comments, some of the things that I think are critical for us are, are one, to know what the expectations are of our business community. And so we have to develop really strong relationships with the business leaders that are in our community and that hopefully will be employing our students as they graduate and, uh, and, and earn their diploma. Uh, but also making sure that our students have uh, the opportunity to, to have that that world open to digital content and, and utilizing devices so that we can help them not only to be good digital citizens, um, but to, to know um, what opportunities are, are out there and expanding. And I think that's been a pretty big shift for our, our, our new teachers, our veteran teachers alike, uh, because there's another skill set in the pedagogy of working with digital devices and opening up that world of digital content um, and incorporating that into the Indiana College and Career Readiness Standards and making sure that we're addressing those uh, for our students as we prepare them for graduation. Jeff, absolutely. Uh, we embarked on a one-to-one -one initiative uh, four years ago that now touches all of our fifth through 12th graders. So every kid has a device. We have to do that because the world is moving very fast and kids need to be engaged in technology. Also, kids have to become better thinkers. And so we're working on creating an environment where our kids can do more critical thinking, more rigorous work, and that requires a shift in thinking amongst our educators and how we deliver instruction to them. Jeff, you're right on point with the business community. We work with them. We partner. So we know exactly what our kids who are seniors, where they need to be in all the professions and making sure that our curriculum all the way back to preschool is set in such a way that we can get workers for the future. Our kids are the next generation. I always use the comment, I'm not going to be around forever. And someone's going to have to take my place. And if we don't have that mentality of training our kids and preparing them for the future, they're not going to be ready for the jobs of the future. And so our whole, one of the areas is boom for us, Jeff, is our career center, our McKinsey Career and Innovation Center. Roughly half of my high school kids engage in that center because of all the opportunities that are available through our business community that it's boomed. Um, our culinary program has expanded, barbering, uh, our auto mechanic, but in the more high-skilled areas of computer and, and our Project Lead the Way program have exploded because we're more targeted and focused on getting kids lined up for those programs. And I will say to the business community, we'll have better workers in the future because we're having that dialogue of how to prepare those kids. And so I, I, I look at it as a positive. I know I, we typically say, well, we don't have enough kids ready. And I see it as a positive. What we can say is let's come together and collaborate and get the kids ready because I believe tomorrow's kids are going to be well prepared. They're better prepared than we were. And we need adults who can be able to guide them to the success. And that's why that partnership is so important. Well, I think to that end, uh, Sean, you mentioned McKinsey and um, you know, we have Area 31 in Wayne. Mm -hmm. The students attending those centers aren't just going out into the workforce. Yeah. Those are students who are still pursuing educational yes. opportunities at, at two- and four-year institutions. Um, Pre-engineering, they're getting, they're getting some terrific skills yes, in our are. career centers as they prepare to go off to college. So, you know, I can remember when I was in school, the kids that were taking SHOP, which is now Career and Technical Education, right. were the kids who were not college-bound. Right. Uh, and, in fact, our college-bound students are taking a great number of courses, many of which also have college credit tied to them Absolutely. with uh, with our, our, our um, Indiana colleges and, and universities. And uh, it's just a great opportunity for students that didn't exist when, when I was a student. Exactly, Jeff. I totally agree. You've both talked about some, some tremendous assets that you have within your districts to educate all students and meet the needs of so many students. How, how in the world have we gotten to a point where uh, public schools are being uh, demeaned, so to speak, and, and not good options when we know that quality public schools are, Jeff, you mentioned this, are economic drivers in most communities. It seems like to me the conversation should be saying, we have great public schools in Indiana. Don't you want to come here? Don't you want to relocate your business here? We have a great place for your employees and families to grow up and live. How have we gone so far afield when we know there's quality public education happening in the state of Indiana? And these are just two small elements of, of districts when we know that it, it happens all across the state of Indiana. 
any comments you'd like to make on that? Oh, I totally agree, Dr. Koopman. I would, no matter where you go from the top of the state to the bottom, there are outstanding things that are going on. The question we have to ask is why are we being negative? What What's the driving force behind that? And that's another show for us. Uh, but uh, in my community, more specifically, when I get on the ground, and Jeff, you probably experience the same thing and talk to our patrons and our business people, they are focused on their kids in the community. And there is pride. There is this sense of hope. And we need to think about that throughout the state, including our elected officials and business people when we when we are negative because because the negativity will lead to people not wanting to put their kids in school, but also people not wanting to come into the profession and teach anymore if there's a sense of hopelessness. But our, our children are doing very well, and given the opportunities, they will continue to excel. You know, I, I, JT, I think we quite honestly did it to ourselves. Um, educators in general are pretty nice people. Mm -hmm. And we went for many years where – uh, we focused on what was happening inside of our schoolhouses. Mm -hmm. We focused on what was happening inside of our classrooms. We didn't pay much attention to the rhetoric that was being um, portrayed or how we were being portrayed in, in uh, the media. And before we knew it, uh, that, that ball was rolling down the hill very quickly. Uh, that train had left the station, whatever analogy you want to use, and we were behind the times. We um, had not been out there being very outspoken about the great things happening in our schools because we knew what those were. We, we saw what was happening inside of our schools. We felt like people would also see those, and we didn't need to go out there and toot our own horn and, and have the media campaigns that we have now and have the, you know, the communication staff that, it, that most districts uh, have or, or at least a, a, a person that they're contracting with to share that information. And it's taken us many, many years to get caught up with that negative rhetoric that began, that, that began uh, long before we started um, advocating for ourselves and, and sharing that information. And I think that's, you know, as we spoke about a little bit earlier, I think that's where we're seeing some of that tide turn uh, is we've been able to get our message out. We've been able to share the great things that are happening inside of public schools across Indiana, and people are starting to understand it. And, and yes. we, that, that's one of the reasons that we've established this forum is to have that message proclaimed. And so that it's a wider message. It's more broadly heard throughout the state of Indiana, and quite honestly, wherever this message goes to throughout the United States, we certainly want that message to be portrayed that we have high quality public schools in the state of Indiana. But on the other side of that, we, we now have heard that uh, public schools are, are not good, and it's not a good place for a profession and to start a profession. And so consequently, we've had uh, teachers leave the profession. We're having difficulty getting teachers into the profession. Any suggestions on how we stem that tide and make the teaching profession the uh, the high quality program that it that it used to be that I enjoyed that that you enjoyed, and uh, I I loved being a teacher. I loved being a school administrator, and uh, you know some of that luster has has worn off as a result of all the negative rhetoric that's going on out there in the public. Any suggestions on how we can stem that tide? Well, I would say to anyone out there, whether public charter, choice, whatever you want to call it, schools have to have great educators. And first and foremost, we have to honor them. So we have to honor the profession again. Uh, I wouldn't be in this chair. Any of these other gentlemen wouldn't be here if it were not for great teachers. We can point to those teachers on what day they gave us whatever we needed in order to be successful. It wasn't a standardized test. It was the relationships that we have with those educators. Um, we have the teachers themselves, and I, I get on our educators. We've, we went into a sense of hopelessness, and, well, it's somebody else's problem, but we are the profession. And the professional educators have to lead their organization. They have to lead their profession and be the voice of why it's important for us to do what we're doing. Uh, we have to focus on our younger teachers and make sure that we're doing everything to retain those that are with us so that they don't lead the profession and grow their skill set so that they will stay with us longer. So we, we have a motto now where we are all about rewarding, retaining our current educators. Uh, to keep them in the profession. So as school superintendents on the business side, how do we create compensation packages and, and, and professional development and resources to keep those young teachers with us in, for many years? Okay. I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, if I remember back to why I first made the decision to get an education, one, uh, my father um, 
continue to share with me how great of a life it was to be a teacher. And, uh, and as I've gone around and, and spoken to our educators, none of the educators that I speak to got into this profession for money. Although we all could agree that our teachers should get paid significantly more for the job that they do each and every day. None of our teachers got in for the summers. None of our teachers got into education so that they could be home by 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the afternoon after the students are dismissed. Every time that I speak to an educator, the reason that they got into education was to make a difference. And I believe that's true with educators across the state. Every one of our schools in the state of Indiana have amazing teachers sitting in the classrooms, working with our students, mentoring them, uh, helping them to become as successful as possible. As we continue to, to share this message that, uh, that we are now doing a much better job sharing, we're starting to see more students interested in pursuing education. But we had an all-time low within the last four to five years where we just did not have students who were pursuing educational degrees in, in our post-secondary institutions. And um, when you have that diminished uh, candidate pool, it makes it very challenging. Uh, and we're seeing a big shift in, in, inside of our schoolhouses now. It used to be the teachers only moved during the summer and that they would uh, stay committed to their classroom, to their job assignment for the school year. And we're seeing teachers leave in October, in, in January, in April. Um, for other opportunities, sometimes in education and sometimes out of education. But um, there is no question that there are very high expectations by the educators that are in our classrooms today. And we continue to add more and more things to their plate uh, and ask them to do more and more things to help our students. And so it, it's not an easy job. And it, it takes uh, people that are committed to our children, people that are committed to making sure that they're providing every opportunity they can. And they really have to be a service-minded individual um, who – uh, is, is willing to, to give. And, and those are the kinds of people we're looking for. Those are the kinds of people that we're encouraging to go into the profession. Uh, in Wayne Township, I've had the opportunity to um, have some, some donations in, in uh, the superintendent's name to the Wayne Township Education Foundation, and we've created scholarships that uh, encourage our young people to pursue an educational degree. Uh, and then, of course, the hope that uh, they'll come back and, and hire us. And to that end, we've changed some of our hiring practices. We just at our last board meeting approved 21 open contracts for teachers who have been student teaching with us that we had an opportunity to watch during their student teaching experience and offer a position before they left for spring break um, so that they would work for us next school year. And, uh, you know, we're, we're recruiting and, and, and uh uh, going out and, and hiring new staff has, has changed a great deal just in the last several years as, as we try to make sure that uh, we have the, the best and the brightest sitting in front of our children. Well, you know, obviously we are we are all passionate about public education. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting at this table, wouldn't be no. doing the jobs that, that, that we're doing. And with the belief system that education is the very fabric upon which this country was built. And so it's very troubling to me that that when we see other countries and what they're doing and the United States is expected to compete with those other countries in a global economy, but they treat education and educators differently than we do here in the United States. And we, we are hoping to be able to turn that around and get the best and the brightest involved in education and, and be in our classrooms and in front of our kids. You have a little bit of a megaphone right now, so to speak. <laughs> and so what kind of advice uh, would you give to current or future educators and educational leaders, if you could offer any? My advice would be, of course, to, to one, um, follow your passion and to never lose sight of that passion that first got you into uh, pursuing an educational opportunity, a, a teaching degree or, or a leadership opportunity. Um, but um, two, I would say that, um, you know, if we continue to make decisions that are in the best interest of our children, um, then we will never make a wrong decision. We know that we educate all, and that's one of the big differences with public education in the United States is regardless of a student's socioeconomic background, um, their uh, status as a citizen, or any other factor, uh, when they walk into our classrooms uh, and they walk into our schools, we're going to make sure that they're educated, and we're going to make sure that they're served and that their needs are met. And we will continue to do that. And one of the things that is job security for us is we know that there will always be children and there will always be an opportunity for children to need uh, public education, regardless of the number of 
for-profit uh, schools that open up or private educational opportunities that, that take certain students uh, from our population, we will always know that there's a need for public education and for the students that are sitting in our classrooms today. Good comments. Sean? Good, good. And I love that, Jeff. The, the, this great democracy cannot grow unless we educate our, our young people. And so uh, as a native Hoosier, I'm, I've been so blessed to have attended great schools in Indianapolis public schools. And, and I grew up in an urban area, but I was my college education was at Indiana University, which is total opposite of where I grew up. And, and the wonderful education that I received in the state and then being able to come back and be able to give to young people is what it's all about. Ladies and gentlemen, we need leaders that have purpose. Uh, we need leaders who are going to be servants uh, in these school corporations because we are servants to the board and to the community to make sure that their children receive a quality education no matter where they're from. Uh, I would also uh, share with our, our leaders is that you need to gain experiences, and I mean rich experiences. Uh, part of the problem we have in education today, we're trying to be so innovative, we forget about the great things we've done for years at work. How do we continue to grow those and grow leaders who are going to come in and provide the excellence that's needed for our school corporations to be successful? Remember, ladies and gentlemen, we have a great democracy. In order for this democracy to grow, we have to have quality public schools throughout. No matter rural, suburban, urban, it doesn't matter. All children, no matter who they are, where they're from, need to be educated so they can participate in our great democracy and capitalism. Dr. Sean Smith, Dr. Jeff Butts, uh, thank you both for being our guest on IPSS's edition of Indiana Education Insight. Up next, we're featuring a national education online trend that is relevant to our local Indiana educational institutions. This is a must-pay attention moment, and that's right now. A national trend that's impacting Indiana. It's time to bring in our featured panel for Five on Five. Five questions for our experts, five expert answers. Joining us in studio is Joanne Jewett, Chief Accessibility Officer at Site Strategics. We talked last show about website accessibility, what it means, what the law is regarding school district websites, and we can go a little bit deeper into that topic again. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you. So, how do you define web accessibility? Well, I know we talked last time in general terms that web accessibility means that the web needs to be accessible for everyone regardless of disability or ability. Uh, but I'd like to talk a little more specifically about that. When we think about a website, um, yes, the site itself needs to be accessible in terms of someone's perception, how they perceive the content. It needs to be accessible in terms of how they navigate the content. Can I go through a page, get to another page? Um, also, the site needs to be uh, uh, there needs to be an ability for anyone to interact with the site. So do I need to fill out a form? Uh, do I need to put in information to be sent to someone else or share with someone else? So in terms of sites, applications uh, that are on the sites, they need to be accessible. Browsers themselves need to be accessible. A lot of times our software and how they interact with, let's say, Internet Explorer versus Firefox, uh, that presents an accessibility challenge. Uh, perhaps media players, there, there can be an issue with that. Um, and one of the things that I hope we can talk about more on this show down the road, it's not just a matter of someone who is accessing my content, but it might also be someone who needs to work with my content. So what about the accessibility of authoring tools? Maybe someone who's on my staff, one of my students, and they're engaged in a tech class. Uh, do they really have the tools that they need to use in order to author a website or put content on it? So you had mentioned the term regardless of disability. So uh, there are broad ranges of disability. Can you give us some examples of what web accessibility needs to be regardless of disability? I sure can. Um, of course, we immediately think about, I think, we immediately think about visual hearing impairments, those types of things. Right. Uh, but there are also mobility issues. Uh, we think about someone who um, perhaps has some type of, uh, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis, something like that, that might prevent them from using a mouse 
uh, or even interacting with a touch screen. So they need another way to do that. Uh, one of the things we don't think about uh, would be perhaps certain mental conditions, uh, anxiety. Uh, attention deficit. Uh, there are all kinds of, uh, of barriers that keep a variety of people from accessing content as it currently is on a website. Well, that's a, that's a huge broad range of things that uh, across the, the country, across the world that, that we need to be cognizant of as far as website accessibility is concerned. Um, are there different kinds of technologies that, that we have to be concerned about with website accessibility? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's not just the website itself, uh, but there are all kinds of technologies that uh, people with a variety of disabilities use to engage with a website. Uh, most commonly, uh, we think about uh, readers. And um, those would be perhaps a, a very, very sophisticated screen readers such as JAWS, the free readers, uh, NVDA, um, and those allow students to, and parents and grandparents and community leaders uh, to be able to access content even though they may have a visual impairment. Uh, and that's just one of many, many tools. For instance, uh, JT, uh, perhaps you and I remember uh, the use of joysticks yep. when we used to sure. use those. Mm -hmm. Well, um, those actually are a part of assistive technology. So for people with certain mobility issues, they may well use a joystick instead of a mouse. Wow. Just very, very interesting how quickly these things change right. and uh, how we have to keep up with them. Is the website owner the only one responsible for the accessibility? No. And that is a great question. Oftentimes, uh, either the owner or the developer is the one that we hold at fault. And quite frankly, anyone who has any responsibility for the website at all is responsible for the content and for all of that information to be accessible. So let's say I'm a content writer, then I need to be careful about uh, the language, the uh, reading level. Uh, am I using terminology that is accessible to anyone who's going to be on that site. Uh, of course, the developers, those who are involved with coding, uh, but also it could go all the way to the legal ramifications. Um, who, who would be consulted in terms of something that is not accessible on a website, not just the owner, uh, but perhaps those who would be consulted for legal reasons as well. Dr. Joanne Jewett has been our guest talking about web accessibility and the tangled web so to speak, that we weave. Uh, we're so glad to have you with us and educating us about website accessibility. We really appreciate you being with us. And now it's time to wrap up this episode with my take on the current state of affairs in Indiana education. Dr. JT's closing comments. Unfortunately, in Indiana, it appears we have a war against Indiana public schools and the promotion of charter schools private and parochial schools supported by vouchers, which are taxpayer dollars supporting non-public schools. IPSS has fought against this issue since it was introduced, but now Indiana is the leading state in the country offering taxpayer support for non-public schools. It seems counterintuitive since we have clear direction from our founding fathers as to the separation of church and state. Perhaps we can pursue this issue in another segment of Insight into Indiana Education. On the next Insight into Indiana Education, joining us will be State Representative and Indiana School Superintendent, Dr. Terry Gooden. Dr. Gooden will provide some additional insight into the State House and education. Talk to us and listen to our podcast on demand. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, or questions. Until next week, stand up for Indiana Public Schools and stay involved.